Hey, what's going on, guys? Alex with NBC 11 Live. Team 1 1, born to compete. I got the man, the myth, the legend right beside me, man. My homie, Coach Downs. Coach, what's up with you? Man, I'm doing great today. I had a wonderful weekend. Got to see some family, got to see some football. What more can you ask for? All right, man. Uh, yesterday, we talked about the matchups and everything like that. There were some good matchups uh, that happened this past weekend. But just off the top of your head, Coach, let's get straight into it. Your power rankings, who would you consider? as the top teams, regardless of classification, as your top teams in the state of Georgia? I'm going to call this my Magnificent Seven. <laughs> I'm going to start with Milton. Okay. They're ahead of the class right now. They've got a complete team. Next, I will go with Hughes because the upside of what they can do with the offense and the size of that line and skill guys. Three, I go with Douglas County. You know what Douglas County brings? Good Lord, they're a pretty team getting off the bus. Val Dawson from way down south. Yeah. Or they say, they look, my man said they play a different brand of football down there in South Georgia. Be ready for that. Gangsville, my man Niblick, don't sleep on him. <laughs> Thomas County Central, they wreaked havoc last year. Don't sleep on them brothers. They're getting it done down there. And then Roswell. Mm. And you know what? Buford's going to be around there. I got to slide them down for this week. They're going to be back. But Roswell, that rounds out my magnificent seven. I, I, I'm going to ask you the, the hard question, Coach. I did not hear Carrollton in there. So t tell me why Carrollton's not in there. Carrollton's been there for the last three years. They're always right on the cusp. Mm -hmm. I mean, I believe when they, get, when they start getting hit, people hitting people in the teeth and all that kind of stuff, they got a little West Coast football to them. I believe they just, they're going to be there. They're going to be close. But I have not seen them win that big one against that big team yet. You know, so right now they're not getting it for me. All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, players uh, that, that stood out to you that really, really caught your attention. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into it. You know, just one player real quick, Coach, off the top of your head that stood out to you. Athlete Elijah Hunter of Douglas, Atlanta. He's their quarterback, starts at safety. He led that team at quarterback, and then on defense, he had two picks. He's a Georgia State commit. I was very impressed with what I saw him leading that team and turn around and what he did on defense. They got a big challenge this week, but he balled out, and he was very impressive in their victory. I got a kid for you, and we talked about uh, Langston Hughes yesterday. I got a guy that we don't talk about as much that we should talk about more, a kid named Jabari Jones. How about this right here? When Jabari Jones was younger, we accidentally, and I hate to say it like this, his award got messed up at the gala, right, when he was younger. And so we had to do a presentation at his school. It was really good. The whole school got involved in it, all that kind of stuff, took pictures with him. We had a great time, right? Now let's fast forward some years later, Coach. He might be on that stage, and we have our B2C Awards Gala for high school uh, this upcoming year because let me tell you something, Coach. Not only did he go out there and play corner for them and give them some good reps on that, but also, too, he was that receiver, caught a touchdown pass, and had, I want to say, it was like a 90-yard touchdown run, Coach. So he had a phenomenal game, and he's one of those guys that he just continues to get better and better and better. And uh, it, 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 like those Swiss Army knives, Coach, right? Huh? He, he can do a lot of things really, really good that you want on your team. He's one of those guys coach, right there. Coach, when I was a kid, I carried a pocket knife. Nowadays, can't carry him around so much. Can't but in around. football, you got to have that Swiss Army knife. A guy that can do it all. All right. Uh, freshman of the week, what freshman stood out to you? I have heard you have told me about this guy. He's like a like the boogeyman, a, a, a myth, a legend. Casey Barner. I mean, you said, look, go Downs. He the closest thing I've seen to Caleb. This cat, I'm out here looking at Douglas Atlanta. I'm like, who's that number two back there in safety? <laughs> oh, that's that Barner kid. That ain't no freshman. I mean, he's like six foot, 185. I mean, the only thing he needs to work on is how to interview better. And he pretty much said, coach, I got to work on my interview skills. <laughs> I said, how did you transition? How was the transition from middle school to high school? Well, coach, the game is a little bit faster, but I think my skill sets <laughs> brought me through. This is a talented individual. He is a ball player. Instinct, understanding, ball skills, body control. He's physical. He can run. Casey Barner started at safety, played wide out, ran the rock. I mean, bruh, it's not fair. I look for him to be an elite power five player in the years to come. But for a freshman, you know, he is way above the curve right now. Casey Barner of Douglas, Atlanta. Uh, we're saying the same thing, Coach. I mean, you just got to give it to him, right? You know, had a nice touchdown run, forced a fumble, just played really, really well uh, for Doug. And here's what I like about him. During the season, 
okay? They're playing football and, and all that kind of stuff. And he was challenged by a guy that we know from our hometown, uh, Coach Ford. Coach Ford, who's now at Georgia State right now, is with the I Dare You program. And uh, he challenged that young man and said, look, we're going to get you better, kid. And that's what they worked on. They got him better. And now, Coach, not only does he have the athletic ability to go uh, with obviously what he can do, but now you look at the skill set, you look at the proper technique, everything is falling into place for that young man. So he'll be just as good as he's going to be. I uh, hate to compare him to Caleb, but that's who I got to compare him to. That's my comp form of players that I've seen uh, over the years. All right, uh, Coach of the Week. I cannot wait to hear this. Come on, Coach. Coach of the Week is my man Drew Swick of Collins Hill. Collins Hill pulled off the, the upset. They were up 3-0. They Grayson scored 19 unanswered points, went up 19 to 3 at halftime. Swick and Swick and the Eagles make a change at halftime. They roll back set, scoring 17 unanswered points in the rain to beat Grayson. I mean, Grayson going up in the jungle like that, being Grayson, that is a tremendous victory. Coach Swick, hats off to you, brother. You know, I'm I'm gonna go with uh Coach Brock Vandergriff. How about that one? <laughs> I know, I'm not know. I boy, anybody say it. Coach Vandergriff. I'm sorry, Coach. Coach Vandergriff, that is who I'm going with. Uh, how about this? They're known to pass the ball all over the field, right? That is what they do. They go play a West Forsyth team that is absolutely a very physical, well-coached team, and they say, you know what? Hold on. You want to go here? We going to go here. Everything you with, I'm with. And they match their physicality, and uh, Ben had a great game rushing. Beard had a great game rushing. And what I saw out of uh, Prince Avenue, I saw that Prince Avenue can roll their sleeves up, Coach. That's what I saw. So I saw they, they can roll their sleeves up. They held to 100 yards rushing. That's West right. Forsyth has a thousand yard rusher every year, and they play physical football. Prince Avenue met them in a hole and shut that thing down. Last week at the Corky Kill luncheon, Coach Vandergriff said, "Let me yeah. tell you about my master plan." <laughs> it's like he's <laughs> a master planner. Yeah. All right, so that's who we have as our coach of the week. All right, coach, a uh, very serious topic, obviously, uh, a tough topic to talk about. But again, this is what we do for a living here. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Bo Walker has been ruled as being ineligible for right now. Um, your thoughts on that? And for, let's go ahead and give some context to it. Bo Walker, fantastic football player, UGA commit, uh, was at Cedar Grove, did very, very well. Uh, then transfers over to uh, Stockbridge. His old coach, former coach that was at Cedar Grove, goes over to Stockbridge, uh, I want to say a week after him, or we'll just say shortly after him, right? We don't have the exact timelines. Let's say, say shortly. Shortly after him, and he is ruled ineligible. Coach, your thoughts? My thoughts is that first, Bo and the coach knew the rule, all right? Bo and the coach knew, knew the rule. Bo moves first. The coach moves second but Bo's held accountable. My second thought is, this is an archaic rule and nowhere else in our society. If me and you were working at IBM and you was my manager and you left and you went to like Qualcomm and I went with you, then oh, you can't follow Alex. There's no rules like this in our economy. Why do we have rules like this in sports? If there's a great art teacher at Shamley High School and she goes to Duluth High School, if I wanna send my kid to Shamley, to go to be in her art class, nobody creates rules like that. They only do it for sports. To me, it's time to, hey, sports are like any other industry. You cannot take away these kids' freedom. I say let freedom ring. Let these players move as they move. Yes, let them move and change houses. Require that that they live in district. But you can't restrict them because a coach went went this way or that way. To me, you're, getting, you're being paternalistic. You're trying to control too much. And coaches, who are you helping by doing this? You're helping yourself. You're not helping the kid. Man, I'll tell you what, uh, Coach Downs, I thought about it, man, because I, I see I see both ways, right? So I see a way where, all right, let's say they hire a coach and a coach brings all those players with them. All right, so is that good for the kids that's coming over? Yes. Is it tougher for the kids that are there right now? Uh, Probably so. You know, almost like uh, with Deion Sanders, uh, I'm bringing my Louie with me. You know, <laughs> those situations. So is that a tough situation? So I kind of understand the rule from there. But also, too, I lean with you. I believe in player player freedom, player movement, whatever you want to say. 
I do believe in that. Do I do believe Bo should have been eligible? I do. If you just really want to, you know, say, hey, hey, we're 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 GHSA, which is, you know, again, that's fine. It's your right. You guys are make the rules with this. Then make them sit out half the season or whatever. You know, there's something you can do. But look, if a player wants to move on, then he moves on. I think here's what happens in my opinion. And this is the, uh, this is me humbly speaking, humbly speaking. I think when Bo came over and then Coach came over afterward, they they did it by the letter of the rule, what you wanted them to do. And I do think somewhere in there, GHSA said, now hold on now. We're not going to have this happen because this might set a precedent moving forward. So again, I see all sides of it. But yes, would I like the kid to be able to be eligible to play? I would. I think they should go more of a case by case scenario instead of a dead rule. Or excuse me, instead of a, a rule in the sand, and uh, you know, like, kind of go from there, coach. Uh, anything else you have to say about that? No, like maybe they do it like college. College at least, at least has the portal windows, and yeah. it's like if a kid wants to transfer, this is your window of opportunity to transfer. If parents make moves during the season, m- most people don't move schools during the season because they don't change addresses during the season most people move in the spring and the summertime they may just need to change the rules hey you want to move you got to move before this period of time no movement after september 1st something like that we don't want kids moving like last year you had the kid that changed from one school played against the school and then oh. move. Like, like you don't want that like you know you're not doing that during the school year but because <laughs> that's that's just wrong i mean okay. that that really just affects competition and planning mm-hmm. for you to do that but during a certain period of time, you want to move from May to August, have at it because yeah. you're trying to do too much. You're trying to regulate too many things. These parents, these kids, their parents are their guardians. They are playing a sport that you regulate, but you're trying to regulate too much. You're trying to regulate these players' movement. All right. Uh, another thing that happened. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Toe stomp, toe gate. I, I know I'm making light of it, and I know it's, it's it's probably not funny. We probably shouldn't laugh at it. However, uh, it happened, and let's just dive straight into it, man. Only one way to handle these type type of topics is you get straight into it. Uh, you know, Milton played Newton, uh, a player from Newton, stepped on uh, the coach's foot. The coach react and hit the kid. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with this one first because I do know all parties involved. And I'll say this, uh, things happen. And uh, this, this is not me being, you know, Alex, the lenient Alex and everything like this. I just know when you've been on that football field, things happen. And sometimes, look, the kid did what he did. Was he wrong? Yes, he was wrong. Should he be uh, disciplined for that? Yes, you work it out with the coach, you work it out with the principal, nothing severe, but you know, hey, a hundred stairs or something like that, you know what I'm saying, in, in the in the, uh, in the stadium, make sure he understands, you know, hey, this is something that cannot happen. Uh, with the coach, oh, that's tough, man, because that's a natural reaction, you know what I'm saying? And I, I would probably say because you don't want to set a president of somebody putting their hands on a kid. We can't do that, right? However... In a situation like that, as I always say, it's probably case by case, maybe half the season or something like that, coach, you know, have that, you know, you know, uh, uh, I guess whatever you have that policy saying, look, if you do it, you do it. It is what it is half of the season. But I don't think this man's life uh, should be altered for this particular situation. What's your thoughts, coach? Well, generally, you all say you don't want coaches putting hands on players and hitting them at the same time. You get in that moment, a kid. Steps it to you, steps on your foot. I've had players at times challenge coaches and what to the coaches. I've had players threaten. I've seen players threaten coaches. And at that point, it's like, you know, you don't have rules for these. And, of course, when people see it on TV or film, they're looking through their very subjective lenses and they don't understand the context. So whoever's making the ruling needs to get down into the context of what happened. And, yeah, we need to protect ourselves because this is – public everybody's seeing it but look if a kid was malicious in this action and stepped on the coach and the coach was protecting himself and he wasn't trying to hurt the kid i definitely understand you know what you got to rule this and maybe the players should be spending for a while and the coach it well but you know generally they got the onus is going to fall on coaches to have restraint 
not put our hands on kids, not even if the kids were malicious. Even when coaches are trying to break up fights, you pull kids off, kid might swing at you, you can't swing back, you can restrain them. So it's just the way it is. You do always lean to the side of the, of the adult having restraint. Kids lose control, things happen, but I don't think the coach, unless he's shown a prior propensity to this behavior, should be out of a job for or out of coaching. Yeah, and, and from what I heard, man, these coaches got on the phone. They talked it out. Um, Alex, I said something so profound. You just froze up. <laughs> Did I freeze up? <laughs> no, we got everything you said. We got everything you said. We heard everything. Uh, but, what you know, I, I was going to end on this. with I heard From what I heard, uh, my sources say uh, the coaches talked to each other. Uh, they kind of hashed it out, you know. Everybody said what needed to be said in the room. It was good. The adults took over, and, uh, you know, they moved on from there. So, again, I, I hate to re bring it up, but we have to obviously talk about it. But those are my opinions on it. And, uh, look, man, again, things happen. You slap people on the wrist. You let them go. And you just say, hey, man, this can't be ever, 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 ever happen again. And you move forward with it. All right. Oh, so real quick. Go ahead. Real quick. Did you see the case in Alabama? I want to say it was at Hoover where there was two, the head coach and the defense coordinator were fired because they were doing a defensive drill and a kid got pancaked or run over and one of the coaches came over and hunched on a kid no. in a sexual manner. Okay. Well, that coach was fired, the defense yeah. coordinator. And evidently they had shown patterns of this. And a lot of parents were upset that they fired these coaches because this locker room field banner, though some say, hey, this is just coaching. They went over borderline because they turned this into a sexual thing and sort of demoralized the player that had gotten ran, ran over. Mm -hmm. And these players are like, well, he's a good man. He's helped us win. He helped a lot of kids. But it's like there's certain levels you just don't take this thing through. And in that case, these coaches were fired because they were essentially hazing kids mm -hmm. and exposing to an environment, a sexually hypervised, a hypersexual environment where, dom where they were like, literally, if I dominate you, they were using sexual terms to say, hey, I dominated you. Yeah. And that literally came out in a video. And so they fired it. In those kind of cases, hey, man, we can't have that. Mm -hmm. Our young code kids learning that type of culture and not using football in that manner. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Coach is exactly right. Everything he's saying. So, like, I think we're, we're both saying the same thing, man. Things are a case by case scenario. Uh, you have to look at the history of the player, the history of the coach, and you just have to go through, hey, look, those are hard, hard decisions to make for those that are in uh, power for that. But hopefully right decisions are made uh, with calmer heads. All right, coach, before we get out of here, your recruiting tip of the week. What you got, coach? Coach, people are trying to get in school. Coach, you done gave out scholarships. You got two kids that done went on the three, three, three kids that went on scholarships. Uh, you got a lot of good things going, Coach. So if anybody know Coach, that means you know. Give us something good, Coach. Uh, this this one is really for the top five percent of the guys that's, you know, elite players, Power 5 or G5 to get the NIL money. When you're dealing with an NIL negotiations and the later part of the process when you've narrowed your teams down to two or three schools, you cannot play one school against another school. And one school makes an honest offer a respectable offer to you, you can't go back to the other school and say, well, they offered me this. Don't do that because the schools will realize, the schools, these coaches know each other and they talk. And if you say, hey, school A is giving me this, if you go tell that to school B, they may not match it, but now they have that information and they can do damage to your image by releasing those things to the public. So you got to be very careful. You know, if I want to go to school A, that's what they're offering. School B, they made the offer. Be careful playing one school against another, you know, because your reputation is, is at stake. And in the, in the end, these schools are going to protect their image, not yours. So if you put that information out there, it's going to get it on the streets. Keep that money stuff quiet. Keep it to yourself. Don't play schools one against another. That's my advice to you. Hey, man, you know, I was writing that stuff down, man, you know, all the good tips you be giving everybody, man. This is, this is, all right, look, man, 
Both are charged for all this. All right, uh, guys, make sure you catch us. NBC 11 Live, Team 1-1. One, one. Uh, again, we want to give a shout-out to the re- recently retired Jeff Hollinger. Hey, man, we love you. Man, hope you enjoy retirement. Uh, Maria, the host of the show, she's fantastic, of course, along with Reg. And us, Born to Compete, the number one segment in the country. Take care. Talk to you guys tomorrow.